The following program is brought to you through the financial support of my landlord, who is still waiting for last month's rent. Production costs are underwritten by my Children's College Education Fund. Domestic distribution has been provided by the management and employees of my local Shopco, who generously surrendered funds previously secured in the purchase of two shirts and a pair of black cowboy cut Wranglers, which I returned for full refund, no questions asked. Studio and recording facilities were obtained through corporate funds by way of clandestine cash payments funneled through various agents and middlemen, after which a small percentage was distributed on the high seas, avoiding tax liability for any sovereign state which might attempt to make its rightful claim. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Pew Charitable Trusts, Public Radio International, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation can all go to hell. It's the Neo Radio Hour. Hi, I'm Peter Donalds, and this is the Neo Radio Hour, home of independent writers, musicians, home tapers, the folk artists of the electronic age. We've got a good mix tonight of spoken word, original music, the caustic yet affable Mr. Sunshine, our social critic at large, has got money on his mind again tonight. He'll be along later. And in our conversation collage, it's Nashville musician Kristen Wilkinson. We're operating on the last phrase of our shoestrings these days, but we're here. It's the Neo Radio Hour. Independent audio art. Beatnik poem number 61. <laughs> Like a Kmart carousel, rounding around tin speaker tunes, she straddled me. Like warm, damp air lips over mine, lower, she straddled me. Like the spreading ass of the setting sun and the din in my ear when I went off to sleep, she straddled me. Like her palm slipping off my chest onto our sheets and the hat using my hair to slide past my ears and the shoulders held back by the too long a dive and the aura that sets on a man in a chair by a TV. Yes, she straddled me.
Conversation collage. This week's guest artist is Nashville musician Kristen Wilkinson. Kristen is at a rather interesting point in her career, which uh, qualifies her as a, as a neo artist. So uh, you'll you'll hear why in just a second as we uh, as my co-producer Frank Skillman talks with Kristen Wilkinson. found 
down. You just you gotta follow follow your bliss. Yeah, you and, know, I, you know, I play on a lot of people's stuff. See, I play viola on a lot of people's records. And, uh, then I, then, you know, I've been doing the arranging thing for a long time, like since 1978. And, you know, all you're doing is sort of trying to guess at what somebody else's dream is and trying to lock into their thing. More like a craft, you know, you use some creativity, but you're basically trying to use your creativity to fulfill somebody else's vision, and after a while, you get to where you lose track of what you're looking for, because you, you know, spend so much energy on what everybody else, not just one other person, but like 50 other people are looking for. So I kind of decided to, I just, well, I got that, this prophecy, I was sitting in a restaurant, and, you know, far be it from me to be, believe in that stuff, but this lady came up to me and started talking in tongues and telling me that I was at the end of the little path I'd been on, and it's funny, because I was thinking the same thing, <laughs> and so... Then I started doing this um, book, it's a pretty cool book called The Artist's Way. Just to, I've been just so french fried by working so hard and, you know, making money and trying to use my creativity to make money for myself and other people. And that book has been very good to get me to re-examine the situation. So, starting about a year ago, maybe more, a little more, I started being on writing more for myself, and that means thinking more, <laughs> just thinking more, and then once you start thinking more, it starts coming out in the music uh, in different ways, and my whole attitudes in life, once they start changing, your music starts changing, your goals start changing, and so that's my current path.
concentrate on your art more than your craft. Uh, do you think about the money, or uh, or know, is that part of the plan? You know, if I had, I don't know. Yeah, I think about it. I wake up in a cold sweat when you turn down, you know, a lot of sessions. Uh, or like right now, I've got somebody wanting me to write and produce a project, which is a very attractive idea to me to get to be employing, you know, writing. But the the subject matter is, uh, I don't know, I've listened to the last stuff they've done, and, you know, it's, it's pretty light <laughs> stuff. And I've been doing all this self-analysis, and I'm in kind of a dark mood right now. And, you know, so I, I guess it's all along I've always gone with where the immediate workaholic money is and you know it is it's like putting me in a sweat to think about not doing that but uh yeah I don't know I I feel like it's been the problem all along is that if you follow if you follow your nose and you just do your creativity you're going to end up okay in life because you know what's money anyway <laughs> if you're not happy and uh, I know all this sounds really simplistic but that's where it's at if you just follow the money you're never going to end up doing what you wanted to do anyway uh -huh. so you know with the family and everything it's kind of put me in a cold sweat but on the other hand it, it puts me in a cold sweat even worse to think about waking up one day and knowing I'm going to die <laughs> pretty soon and never having done it, you know, what I set out to do. So, does any of that make any sense? Musician Kristen Wilkinson trying to avoid the cold sweats in Nashville, Tennessee. She's our featured guest artist tonight in conversation. You're listening to the Neo Radio Hour, independent audio art. I'm Peter Donalds, and uh, this next song is a Kristen song. It's called... Tennessee Rain. We'll hear more from Kristen a little later in the show. Show you and take back the words that drove us up. 
I've got two questions for you. First, if nobody had to work for money, if all of our basic needs were covered, food, shelter, health care, transportation, clothing, education, what would you do with your life? Second question, how do you think most people would answer the first question? Oh, they wouldn't do anything, right? They'd get lazy and fat, no motivation. Society would fall apart at the seams. Well, was that your answer for yourself, that you'd do nothing? I know that wasn't your answer. So I've got a third question for you. Do you think you're better than everybody else? Better than most? Half? Some? Yeah, you're probably better than some, I'll give you that. But you see what I'm getting at here? If you didn't have to work for money, you wouldn't do nothing. I know this, because you see, I've been asking this question for years, and every person I've asked would do something constructive or creative, even noble. Many would study, become doctors, teachers, scientists, social workers. Others would paint, write, or sculpt. Feed the hungry, become an inventor, work for the environment, run for political office, run a farm, raise their own kids. These are the answers I get, and from them I've drawn three very happy conclusions. First, each of us is comprised of a unique set of interests and talents. Second, we are eager for self-enrichment. And third, we possess an innate yearning to serve one another. The way I figure it, if each of us had the same chance to do whatever we wanted, society would have all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers we need. We'd be up to our ears in learning and art. We'd have a severe shortage of drug dealers, hookers, and advertising executives. But what about the few lazy couch potatoes who contribute nothing, just take and never give back? So what? Let them. But that isn't fair. Get over it. This tiny percentage of freeloaders would likely inherit the lowest possible social status, if that makes you feel any better. You and your friends would be doing exactly what you wanted anyway, so just let it go. In case you haven't noticed, there's plenty to go around. But if nobody has to work, who's going to collect the garbage? Jeez, as if I had a nickel for every time I've heard this one. It's the classic bonehead defense of wage slave advocates, for which there is a very simple answer. Collecting garbage and emptying bedpans and scrubbing floors would get done because reasonable people would simply see to it. This goes for everything. Money was never supposed to be the motivating factor for the production of necessary goods and services. It was supposed to be a convenient mode of exchange. Obviously, this is no longer the case. Money has become the most dynamic, elemental force in social, cultural, political, and industrial decision-making. Eliminate the twisted influence of money, and the marketplace of ideas would finally be free to invent positive new ways to get things done. Workers and managers could spend a little time each day cleaning their own workplace as a source of pride. Maybe the more unpleasant jobs could be done by students and apprentices as a requirement for their advancement in a particular field. Positive motivation and reward would replace subsistence wages, and there'd no longer be the need for a permanent underclass to do the dirty work. I mean, how in blazes did we ever sink so low as a civilization that millions of people have to be coerced into menial, unsatisfying, or degrading jobs under the threat of homelessness and poverty? Wages are not reward. They are a temporary reprieve and a constant reminder of this threat. This is not the only way to provide us with our material needs. We're past this. If you don't believe me, ask the next ten people you see the following question. If nobody had to work for money, if all of our basics were covered, what would you do with your life? Let me know what you find out. This is Mr. Sunshine.
I used to pretend that, like, you know, think about one day I could just go on the radio station and sing along with the records. <laughs> and then one day, I, uh, I, I was, we were walking in um, two guys' department store, one of those places like that, and I saw we were in the stereo department, and this is before they even had cassettes, I bet. It was like they had these reel-to-reel tape players for sale. And I just stood there and I was staring at him. Oh my God, you mean I could like put what I do on that tape and, you know, and have that tape recorder (laughs) and own that tape recorder and put my music on that tape and work with it. Boys, but you've been, you went to, I mean, all through elementary school and junior high and high school you were playing right yeah i was playing i was playing um like uh classical violin and then i started playing in um like some friends of mine had like garage type bands i started doing that and then i heard one day i heard somebody playing the banjo This is when I got to college, and I thought, man, that is a cool instrument. <laughs> and uh, so through him, I met, I just went up to this person and started talking to them, and through him I got kind of linked up with some people that were into bluegrass music. And, uh, you know, at that time, I think they were really excited to have somebody around that could play the fiddle. So, uh, you know, they would put up with me learning (laughs) how to play country music. I had never really heard it, but I got deeper and deeper into country music. And, uh, man, I just, I I don't know why, but I just started loving country music. And I got real deep into it with playing with some western swing bands and some bluegrass bands and um, just some straight-ahead country bands. And um, after that, I wanted to get back to studying a little bit more because I thought that would make my chops better. So, you know, just technique and everything. So, so I started playing, uh, practicing classical again. And uh, after a while, it just all started fitting together. I think that, you know, every little step of the way, it's like you just gain a little more experience and and you get introduced to different kinds of music. And, and, you know, around that time, I uh, met a guy named David Amram, who's like this crazy guy (laughs) up in New York who plays jazz and is a classical composer. And that got me involved a little bit in some, you know, seeing and hearing, hearing some really good jazz, like getting to sit in like with some incredible people and them just accepting me, hey, you know, she plays fiddle (laughs) and she can sit in with us, you know, and we play jazz. And and then, um, you know, after that, I kind of started my journey here to Nashville. I joined a bluegrass band and came down here. And, you know, I think that was a really cool period of my life. Um, I was pretty broke all that time, so when I got down here, at first, you know, it was was hard going, getting locked into a a thing, you know, but once once I hit, it was like I, I started getting work pretty steady, and I had some good luck, you know, doing some arrangements on some big hits, and... You know, the, the problem was that I had never earned a whole lot of money before. And, uh, you know, I got hooked into that whole thing of just, man, it's just so awesome to have money for the first time in my life. That I think I got a little bit off of the track of creativity, you know, but, but that's where I'm at now. It's hopefully combining both, you know, putting everything together. A lot of country music is, is American music, you know, like a lot of what you hear of country music on the radio is just, is pits, man, it's horrible. 
it's nothing. It doesn't have nothing to do with country music, but except that it's on country radio. Hey, it's like these people here have invented a certain form of music that's American music, you know, that people like Copeland, you know, all have drawn from, you know, that Americans, it's their music. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's something that started here, that grew up here, and, and, you know, I think way more than, like, classical, you know, what's termed classical music, this, this is American music. And uh, it's really cool, you know, it's a really cool art form. Kristen Wilkinson, tonight's featured guest artist in our conversation collage. Chris plays viola, violin. She's a writer, arranger, and producer. She spoke to us from her home in Nashville, Tennessee. Oftentimes on the show, we have young, struggling artists. Uh, interesting to get the perspective from someone like Chris, who's uh, had some great success, actually, and is now taking sort of a step back in order to take a step forward with her own her art and her own music. And we're happy to hear her thoughts tonight on the show. I'm Peter Donalds. You're listening to the Neo Radio Hour. Independent audio art. Young Roscoe and Ant Boy were a father and son con team from San Francisco. They were masters of the short change and bag game and ran the football pools at a couple of restaurants at the wharf. Dressed to the nines, they sauntered through the fog to meet with Big Frankie for the mob. They figured it was something big, because Big Frankie was no cheap pig. He was a guy that got respect. At the corner of Bush and Mason, they were met by a somber looking man, a six button bent, who led them up the stairs of a building that was decorated with gargoyles, grotesques, and a pair of seals, which bore a noticeable resemblance to their escort. The cage elevator took them to the top floor where they were patted down by a couple of mugs with identical scars on their left cheeks. Inside, they were led to Big Frankie's sitting room by a good-looking curly-headed doll who was poured into a black silk evening dress. Young Roscoe gave Ant Boy a nod and a wink as he oogled the babe. Would you boys like a cappuccino or espresso? She cooed. Ah, uh, two double caps, if you please, Joel Roscoe. It was then that Big Frankie stepped into the room. Welcome, boys. Please, have a seat. Big Frankie gave young Roscoe and Ant Boy the once-over with his steely blues as he sipped his double espresso from a demitasse and fingered the scar on his left cheek with a jeweled pinky. I've been hearing good things about you boys from my associates. They tell me you have uh, potential. As Big Frankie gazed down at his reflection in the high gloss lid of his grand piano, Roscoe leaned towards Ant Boy and whispered out of the side of his mouth. Should I slug him? He's giving us a compliment, Roscoe. Just cool it. Frankie looked up and smiled, exposing a golden molar. I believe you guys are familiar with a Benny Kirkpatrick. Ant Boy and Roscoe eyeballed each other. Roscoe cleared his throat. <laughs> uh, yeah. The kid here and him, they took piano lessons together with old man Scalini over on... Well, that scotch bastard's into me deep, and I ain't been able to find him anywhere. The guy sat up to attention. Now, if you could dig him up, 
there's a nice piece of change in it for you. And I should also mention that I'm always looking for a couple of smart guys to do some other work for me. You get my drift? Back on Wall Street, Roscoe produced two biscotti from his cashmere overcoat. Have one, Aunt Boy. I like these. These are delicious, huh? Oh, that tomato, Frankie's with something, huh? Va 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 boom! I think she liked me. Jesus Christ, Dad! You lifted them from Big Frankie's. The guy likes his biscotti, you know. What the hell's the matter with you? Yo, yo, wait a minute. You're calling me Dad. Something's wrong. What's eating you, son? Sorry, young Roscoe. It's just that I know exactly where Benny's hiding now. Well, let's get him. Said Roscoe, slapping the Scotty crumbs off his hands. Hang on a minute. You see, me and Benny have become good pals recently. We've been jamming in Madame Fu's cellar. And we're thinking of putting together a combo and uh, hitting the road. You've been smoking that funny shit up there. We should be working for Big Frankie. Opportunity's knocking. Hey, I'm tired of that bullshit. I'm a young guy. We're making some great music, me and Benny. They fought like only fathers and sons can fight. Yelling, gesturing, pushing each other. To the very edge of physical violence. On the street, their arguments would frighten passers-by. At home, young Roscoe would explain to his bothered neighbors, Oh, don't worry, don't worry. It's, it's just a Jew thing. Come on, Roscoe. I'll take you up to see Benny. We gotta figure something out here. Yeah. 
expose to the world. My thoughts are my developer, bringing everything into focus in my face. My face is the label on the outside of the box, telling everyone just how to treat me, how much light to give me, how long to wait for me, what kind of bath to put me in. Excuse me, ma'am, says the jazzy cop. I'd like to bestow the spirit of the law upon you, you know, make sure your roots are in clean soil. My family ate our roots the winter of 54, she says. I was less than one then, and colorless as a blob of dirt. Sorry, ma'am, I didn't know, he said, succumbing to the heavy ink of her stare. The sun is down and counting. The wet beauty of fog is meant to dry traffic light of realism. The night rolls under itself. We hear a low, a low brass choir. They holes decorate the donut shop counter. Her feet are apart. A chill breeze picks up and drops into place. She swings the door open and steps outside. Injured mood 
continues. This street is just an ugly scab on the city's skin, she thinks. Yuck! There's Alfred, that awful boy who wants to nibble on my breasts. Angela, the boy says, I brought you some cheese. Crackers. The lines deepen in her face from light dialogue into neo romanticism. It's dark now. It's dark now. The evening is filtered into the air like an army of worms. I met her for the first time there in front of the post office. Hi, I said. Hi. You don't. for listening. That'll do it for this time. I hope you taped it. I'm Peter Donalds.